It's uh, uh, July July 1st, Saturday. This is part 2 of our lesson, Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. If you haven't seen part 1, you can go back on our YouTube channel and watch uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. You can go back and see part 1. We're studying the book of Titus, and what we're reviewing, or what we're looking at, and so far we've seen in Titus chapter 1 and Titus chapter 2, how uh, Paul tells Titus to go onto the island of Crete, and to uh, beware of the circumcision and deceivers, and to set up elders, and to uh, talk to and stabilize and, and set up the aged men and the aged women, the young men and the young women. And now we're seeing masters and servants to uh, set up their relationship accordingly to the Word of God rightly divided. And so what we're seeing is we're in Titus chapter 9 and 10. We're about to go into verse 10 now. And what we're seeing is that he's talking to uh, the servants and the masters and trying to set up their order. And so we talked about uh, last time how st a studying a master-servant relationship can lead to topics about racism, can talk about uh, slavery, can talk about you know issues about how the Civil War, how both sides took their Bible, and one said we're all about uh, slavery, and the other side said we're not about slavery, and they used the same Bible, and even Abraham Lincoln said that. Abraham Lincoln said, I'm watching two sides of the Civil War use the same Bible, pray to the same God, and I'm watching this happen right in front of my eyes, essentially. I'm, I'm misquoting him, but I quoted him on part one if you want to go back and see that. So we're seeing this occur. Or you can go back in history, study the books, and see that occur. So uh, we're also studying a lesser literal version of this, you know, spiritual lesson, if you call it, where you can say master and servant is like a supervisor at work. Uh, it's, it's less literal, but it's also a good spiritual lesson. You can, you can take and apply this and, and, and learn this for a deeper Pauline lesson and, and do so accordingly. But we're trying to get some good lessons out of this on both sides and, and learn this from the Word of God, rightly divided, and go, go forth with this with a better understanding. Because Titus did so on the island of Crete, back in the year of about 66, 68 AD. We're not taking the exact year and running with it. We're saying it's about 66 or 68 AD. And as we go further on the chart, we're going to go forth and this is where we left off, about the Civil War and how both sides of the Bible were being used. That's about 1,800 years later from where Titus, where Paul wrote to Titus and gave him these instructions that we're seeing in Titus chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. And these instructions, all of them, all 13 epistles, um, as we go through and see them, concerning where Paul's talking to the body of Christ, live all the way up to where we are today in 2017. So we see that there. So we're going to go and we're going to continue on in verse 10 of Titus chapter 2. And let's see, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and read verse 9 because it continues the thought from verse 9 into verse 10. And then we'll go into verse 10. It says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. And here we are here, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So we see the first two words in verse 10, where it says, I'm not purloining. And so we would say, well, what's purloining? And some synonyms for that word, some things that that means is, you know, not stealing, not looting, not, not taking things. You know, purloining would be not, not to steal. So that would be good for a servant not to do. We also look back at our first lesson about um, Philemon. And we saw that he was a good example of someone who was now saved, established, and stabilized. And he was going back, Onesimus was going back to Philemon. And, and Paul said, receive him as if he were me. So, because he's, he's now going to be profitable. Now we're going to look at some examples of some unprofitable servants, some people who were servants to some some uh, prophets of God, and how they were, the last thing they were were good servants. They were their bad servants, and they purloined, they stole, they took. And in the prophecy program, that that made bad news for them. So if you look, if you look at let's see verse. Or 2 Kings verse chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 20. It 
Second Kings chapter five. And verse 20. And what we're going to see, we're going to see, let's see, we're going to see Elijah's, Elisha's servant. And Elisha's servant, his name is Gehazi. And Gehazi, he's someone who is, the last thing he is, is, he is he's not a good servant. He's, he's greedy. And what he does is he purloins, he steals. And what we see here in verse 20 is he says, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman, this Assyrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So he's already saying, I'm going to take somewhat of him, of Naaman. And Naaman uh, went forth, and, and uh, as you can see previously in, in that verse, uh, there was a miracle that happened to him. But the miracle happened, and there was no... There's no cost to this prophetic miracle that miracles don't happen today in the dispensation of grace. But what you're seeing in this chapter is that uh, Elijah kind of goes off and his servant, uh, Gehazi, runs after Naaman, the person that just had a miracle happen to him. His leprosy was, was cleansed out. And so verse 21 says, so Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there is, or there be, uh, uh, there be come to me one Mount uh, Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments, and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare uh, them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand, and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. So, what we're seeing is uh, Gehazi takes money when he shouldn't be taking money from Naaman. Elisha uh, prayed to God and a miracle happened to Naaman and Naaman had leprosy and Naaman's leprosy was was wiped clean of him as a, as a miracle showing that Elisha was a man of God. So the leprosy is gone out of Naaman. But uh, Gehazi runs after him and says, well, you know, I need some, I, you know, we need some money for these people over there. And so Naaman says, yeah, sure, hey, you know, no problem. Gives him gives this servant money, so he's purloining. He's doing something wrong. He's stealing. And so, if you look at verse twenty-seven, here's his punishment for Gehazi. He says, "The leprosy, therefore, of Laman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever." And and he went out from his presence as a leper, white as snow. So the leprosy that Laman once had now went on to Gehazi as a punishment. So I said, this guy that you stole from, you're now going to get the disease he once had. And now that's now his disease is your disease. So he said, you want to, you want to purloin? You want to steal? What I cured him of, you now have. So, and this is, in the, this is history. This is actual history. This is literal. This is real. This really happened. This is in the prophetic program. This is not going to happen to us today. But nonetheless, if we go back to Titus... When you look at verse 10, what we see there is not purloining. So what the Apostle Paul is telling Titus to teach others is don't, don't, uh, you know, as you have that master-servant relationship, don't steal. You know, it's, it's wrong to do so. You know, don't steal. If you're, if you're, if we go back to this idea where we're at work and you know, we're listening to our managers or our supervisors, don't steal time, don't steal property, don't steal anything. It's, it's a wrong thing to do. You know, serve, serve who you're there to serve. You know, at work, we're going back to this spiritual lesson we're taking from this. So we see that there. And then uh, another one we can look at if we go to Acts chapter 5. Again, from the prophetic program, Acts chapter 5. The Apostle Paul's not even saved until Acts chapter 9, so we're not in the dispensation of grace when we go to Acts chapter 5. 
And we're going to see more purloining. People that are keeping money when they should be giving it all out. People who are stealing when they shouldn't be stealing. And so Acts chapter 5, verse 1. It says, But a certain man named Ananias would Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So what you're seeing is Ananias and Sapphira. They sell all that they're supposed to sell, which is what the Lord commands people to do in Luke chapter 12. So, as a footnote, if you're trying to obey today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you need to read Luke chapter 12, where the Lord tells the Jewish apostles to sell all that they have. So if you're trying to obey everything you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you should be selling every single thing you have, just like the apostles did. And you can see that in Acts 2.44. But by the time you get to Acts chapter 5, you find two, a uh, husband and wife, a Jewish husband and wife, that hold back. And they keep part of that money. They're purloining. They're stealing. They're holding back. And so Peter says, why, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost about this? And there is a reason why in Luke 12, the Lord tells the little flock of Israel to sell all that they have. And that's for the upcoming economy of the Mark of the Beast that you can find in Revelation chapter 13 that the Antichrist is going to set up during the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And so you can see that occur in Revelation chapter 13. We won't turn to it, but everyone's going to have to take the mark of the beast either on their hand or on their forehead. And so property and everything else is going to have to be managed by the little flock of Israel so that they don't have to take the mark of the beast, but they have everything in common. Everything is taken care of. Everything is safe at the moment. They can, they can go about and live as they need to live. So, uh, but they hold back. They keep money. They... they Ananias and Sapphira here purloin and they hold back and that's not good they could end up being a part of the uh, antichrist world system as they keep holding back and as a result they're killed so uh, we know that's not going to happen to us today if we hold back but nonetheless as we go back to Titus <coughs> excuse me Titus chapter 2 verse 10 what we're seeing here is it says not purloining and so we see those two examples of, of uh, purloining through bad servants, through Ananias and Sapphira on one hand, and Gehazi on the other hand. And we're seeing examples of uh, purloining and how that's a wrong thing to do. And as that master-servant relationship is, is established from Paul to Titus, and then from Titus to those that are on the island of Crete, and how we should learn that as well, that uh, purloining is a wrong thing to do. So we see that there. In verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. So he says there in the next part of this verse, it says showing all good fidelity. So some synonyms that have to do with fidelity is going to be faithfulness, loyalty, allegiance. What the Apostle Paul is, is teaching Titus to teach others uh, in that master-servant relationship is not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Show, show all, this, all this faithfulness. You know, as a servant, show your faithfulness, show your allegiance, you know, show your show your diligence, show you know whatever it is that is going on. If we're going to apply this to us for this lesson we're taking, uh, show your show your um, fidelity, show your faithfulness, your allegiance to whatever it is that's happening at work. Show it to your master, your manager, your supervisor. You know that's that spiritual lesson we're taking. Or to the themes that are going on at your work. And also, you know, the master-servant relationship, the literal <coughs> words on the page, masters and servant, they need to show fidelity towards them. And so you don't see too much of this in American society today. But nonetheless, the master-servant relationship, that was going on back in year 66 or 68. That was something that they had to obey. And that was good that they obeyed that. So... We see that in Titus chapter 2, verse 10. And there's a reason why they're being told not to purloin and to have all good fidelity. And we see that in the rest of verse 10. It says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. 
So we're seeing that they may adorn, which is to enhance or to embellish, some synonyms that have to do with the word adorn. They may enhance or embellish. The doctrine of God. Uh, where'd it go? Doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So we're seeing that they would adorn the doctrine of God, you know, through through works and good behavior, you know, not for salvation, but that it's a right thing that they, you know, Ephesians 2.10, that, they, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And also, uh, 1 Timothy 3.13, that we ought to know how to behave in the church of God. So behavior and works are something that does need to occur as members of the body of Christ. Grace is not a free-for-all where you do anything you feel like. We've got instructions that we do need to study, learn, and obey in our Bible right the divided. So, what we're seeing is that they adorn the uh, doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And so the doctrine of God our Savior, what we're seeing as this applies to us today in the dispensation of grace would be Pauline doctrine that we find in his 13 epistles. So we can find things such as that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is doctrine in time past. You're not going to try to obey that today. You're going to study that and, and, and learn from that. And uh, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That would be Romans 15 and verse 4. And so what we're also seeing is that Jesus Christ is according to the revelation of the mystery today. Jesus Christ is not according to his earthly ministry in Israel, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's something that have that's already happened. We need to know where he is today, our Lord, and what he's doing. And you find that out by studying Paul's epistles and understanding them according to the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, starting in Acts chapter 9. Going further back, we'll put you in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and have you learning what he did with Israel. So, you don't want to do that. You want to study um, and adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And so we see that in this uh, area here. Also, you want to also learn the, the parts of the mystery. When we talk about the revelation of the mystery, and you're still saying, well, I really don't know what that is. I understand there's six parts to the, to the mystery, but I'm not sure what that is. You've got to study that out. You've got to learn what that is. Because if you're the ones in charge explaining that to other people, and you yourself don't know what that is, you need to find out what that is. You need to search it out, study it out, or find somebody who can tell you what that is so you can write that down and be able to refer to that at any point in a conversation with somebody. Because if you can't tell somebody what that is, how can you pass on the doctrine of God our Savior? Which is you know, Pauline doctrine today. So, we see that there, and, it, and, it, and it's going to pay off in the end at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, but some, some good examples where we can see from verse 10, uh, you know, an idea of a good servant, where it says, uh, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. If you go to Genesis chapter 39, we're going to go into time past and look at an example of a good, a good servant. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 8. And we're looking at Joseph. Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 8. And what we're seeing here, he says, um, well, why don't you go to verse 7? And it says, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master uh, wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath in my, uh, to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do uh, this great wickedness and sin against God? So you see what Joseph's saying with his own words. He's saying, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So Joseph knows that if he, when he does something wrong, he's not sinning only against the individual, his, his master. Joseph the servant, since we're talking about that servant and master in Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Joseph is looking at the perspective, and it's an excellent lesson to learn from. He's saying, how can I 
when I do something wrong, when I sin, you know, he's not only saying I'm sinning against the, the person, I'm sinning against God when I sin. The sin that I'm committing is against God. It's not merely the person. I'm sinning against God. And I don't want to do that, is what he's saying. So that's an excellent perspective. When you look at the fact that when you sin, you want to look at it from a perspective. You're sinning against God when you sin. So that's a good idea to try to, if I can say this in the right way, try, try to stop your sin. Try to sin less. And of course, if you, if you stop sinning 100%, let me know. Because uh, I, want, I want to learn that from you. But in other words, you know, sinning less or less often or, you know, is what we're all here to do anyway. We're here to, you know, um, have good works and do good works not for our salvation, but just to live a life of godliness and have a, have a worthy walk. So we can see that for Joseph, that he was always making sure he didn't sin against God. You know, against man was one thing, and that was bad enough, but he said, I, I do not want to sin against God whenever he did something. So that's an excellent lesson from a good servant in that servant-master relationship. So we see that there. And so if we look also what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. And what he says here, we can actually look in verse 1. He says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So it's important that a man be found faithful as ambassadors of Christ, as soldiers of Christ, as uh, doing the work of an evangelist, that a man be found faithful. So that's something we need to consider and that we need to do as we consider that servant-master relationship when we're looking at this today in Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And so uh, we see that there. And when we look at this, as we were going back to it, uh, not, uh, going into verse 10, reading that again, <coughs> excuse me, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You can see that there's, there's a payoff for doing that which is right in the dispensation of grace concerning your worthy walk, concerning your workmanship, concerning your good works. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24. Colossians chapter 3. And in verse 24, what we're seeing here, we read this, we read the, the, the verses that were a little further up earlier in part one of this lesson that we did. Now what we're seeing here says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, that's the judgment seat of Christ, for ye serve the Lord Christ, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So what you're seeing is, is you're not going to get away with it. As a saved member of the body of Christ, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, if you're not doing the work of, of an ambassador, it says in verse 25, He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. So if you don't do the work, you don't get the reward. And it is the reward. It's not talking about going to hell. Christ died for our sins. We're saved from hell. But don't expect a good day to occur if we're not doing the work. And we see that in verse 25. It says there's no respect of persons. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter who they are on this earth at this time. Don't do the work. Don't get the reward. It's just that simple. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. You do the service, you get the reward. So he's saying that in the book of Colossians. You work and it's Pauline, it's Pauline work. You're not out there trying to heal everybody. You're not out there trying to do Roman Catholic for everybody. You're not out there trying to do Jehovah Witness or Seventh-day Adventist to everybody. But you're doing Pauline, you know, Apostle Paul's information to everybody, a work that's worthy. 
then at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll get inheritance. You'll get a reward. If, if someone gives you their inheritance and someone writes something in their will to you and it's their inheritance from them to you, that's their inheritance. God's saying at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll get thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. You'll receive a seat of some type or some type of a thing. You can see that in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So even your reward has to do with Christ. Whether it's thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, it's not set up so that you can enjoy yourself. It's set up for him, your, your reward in heaven. Everything is about Christ. Even your reward is, is regarding Him. Your place in heaven is about Him. So when you get to heaven, you're not going to sit back and relax. It's all about working for Him. So that's why you start now. Because when you get there, you continue where you left off. And if you do nothing here, you're going to be in a pretty bad spot up there. If you start here and you work here, you'll be picking up in a good place up there. But you won't be in hell. So... We see that there. Then we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 1. We see more about the master servant relationship in this as well. And what we see here it says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort. So he's going on in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, talking more about the servant master relationship, even if they're uh, believing brethren, you know, don't despise them, you know, serve them. And this goes more to what we were talking about in part one, you know, the type of master-servant relationship you could see that was going on in the year 66 or 68, which is far different than what was going on in the type of slavery that was occurring in, in, civil, in the U.S. Civil War. It's been twisted into something different uh, that's not of the Bible. It was, the scriptures were twisted in, in, 18, in the 19th century to, to twist slavery into something horrific. So, we see that there, but still talking of this conjures up images of, of, of slavery and racism and so on and so forth. And so let's look at some of the cures for Christian racism, so to call it, or Christian uh, ideas of slavery, because there are the cures for this, and it's in the scriptures. But number one, if we look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, and we'll eventually get to this verse as we go through the book. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. <clears throat> what we're going to see here is, it says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So we're seeing in this dispensation that it's not about uh, human achievement, uh, and it's not because of the genes that we're born with. It's not with the skin color that we're born with. It's not human achievement that we get spiritual blessings. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places because of what Christ did for us, irregardless of our skin color. So we're not going to look and say, well, this race is better than this race because of their human achievement. It has nothing to do with that. What we're looking in the dispensation of grace as believers is that Christ did everything necessary to pay for our sins, irregardless of the skin color. It doesn't matter. So that's number one. Number two... If we look at Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. <clears throat> what we're going to see here is typically some people like to claim that they're Israel, whether it be, well, incorrectly, uh, a race. A race will say that they're the new Israel today, whether it be the the clan, the Ku Klux Klan, or, or the Hebrew Roots movement. There will be all sorts of different 
races claiming to be that they are the new Israel or the replacement Israel or, or the latest Israel. And so what we're going to see here, it says, I say then, Romans 11, 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So it says through their fall, that would be Israel, so what you're seeing in Romans 11, 11 is Israel has fallen today in the dispensation of grace. That's a part of the revelation of the mystery. And so no, no race today can claim that they're Israel. Not, not a white race, not a black race, not any other race can claim that they're Israel. Because today Israel has fallen in the dispensation of grace. That's why the Lord is operating through the body of Christ. And you can only find that by studying Paul's epistles. So races are not going to matter in the eyes of God, and it shouldn't matter in the eyes of men. Everyone can be saved by trusting the same gospel, and that's what God set up for everybody. So we see that there. And then as we continue on, we can see in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and then let it go into Colossians 2 verse 10. It says, For in him, that's Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So the head of the body of Christ, the head of all believers today, is the Lord Jesus Christ, and in him are we complete. So we're not complete in, in, our, in our genealogy, we're not complete in our skin color, or we're not complete in our nationality, we're not complete in whatever country we come from. We're complete in Christ. And that's why we want to get the gospel to other people so that they can also be complete in Christ. And there's no exception to who we get the gospel to. We get it to everybody. First Timothy 2 4 is to have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. There's not an exception. There's not a well except for these people here. It's for everybody. Everyone is to be saved. That they trust the gospel and go to heaven. Everyone heaven is available to everyone upon them trusting Paul's gospel. So we see that there. Then we look at Second uh, Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. And we're going to look at verse sixteen. And so what we're going to see Second Corinthians chapter five verse sixteen. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Either we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So what we're seeing there, we're not going to look at anybody or analyze anybody according to their flesh, according to their race, not even the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to know them uh, not according to the flesh. So we see that there in verse 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. The flesh is not the issue. The flesh is not what matters. The flesh is not where you're going after uh, you're going after to see their soul saved with Paul's gospel. So it's all it's not about their nationality. Or what country are they from? Uh, God's not in the nation building business today at all. He's, he's not building up Israel. He's not building another type of Israel. Nobody is Israel. Your nation, the United States doesn't matter in the eyes of God. Uh, no nation matters. No race is more important than the other. We're all, you're either saved or you're lost. And that's where we're at today. And then 1 Timothy 1, 4, and we'll start to wrap it up. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. The Apostle Paul is teaching Timothy, and what he says to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, he says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. What he's saying here is not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies. And you can see endless genealogies occurring in, in all sorts, in sorts of different religions. You can see it in the Mormons. You can see it in all sorts of different ones. We had talked earlier about uh, Josiah Priest. He was an individual who promoted slavery uh, in uh, Around this, on the 
18, around the Civil War, 1861 or so. But you can find, sadly, as we mentioned earlier, you can find issues of slavery um, in the Grace Movement today. You can find that in Grace School, the Bible. It's taught. It's in Genesis Class 103, Lesson 5, sadly. It's the Shem, Ham, and Japheth racial prophecy that's being taught today. So they're teaching the opposite of what the Bible promotes, which is what we're seeing here and what we just talked about. No racism, no slavery, no, none of that. And then you'll go hear the opposite if you take Grace School of the Bible. You can also see that uh, the Mormons believed up until 1978 that blacks were spiritually inferior. So the Mormons were guilty of this, and, it's, and that's a sad thing there. Uh, it remained illegal until 1967 for people to marry, even here in America, and that's a sad thing for American history. But we can see that there. You can see uh, all sorts of different things that come up in different parts of different religions that they'll teach. You know, this race is inferior to this race because we're the one true Israel, or so on and so forth. But we know that as we go back and we see that master-servant relationship, that a lot of issues can come up as these verses are read. Whether you go and read Colossians, or Philemon, or Titus, or Ephesians, you can see that a lot of things come up just in these two verses. We've spent almost an hour just in two verses of the book of Titus. And we're up drawing charts, we're up talking this, we're reading different pamphlets uh, to, to illustrate points that... Uh, what racism is not allowed, is, 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 is forbidden in the Bible. We're all of one blood, Acts chapter 17 talks about. And so for that to be promoted in the grace movement means you're going down the wrong track, which is why we don't associate with that on one, on one point alone. There's many others, such as the deity of Christ and others. And so we see that in, <clears throat> we see that in uh, this one here. But going back to Titus, Titus chapter 2, and we see that in verse 9 and 10, we're seeing that this is what Paul's telling Titus concerning that master-servant relationship. We saw earlier he had set it up with the circumcision, deceivers, elders, aged men and women, young men and women, and now we're wrapping up uh, for tonight with the master-servant relationship. So, if there's any questions... No question? Okay. So we'll stop for tonight with here, and we'll pick up next week in another 